The Colburn Bible taken from 3,600 years old ancient texts The Book of Creation extracted from the Great Book of the Sons of Fire An account of the beginning of things and why they are as we find them Chapter 3 and 4. Chapter 3 The Destruction and Recreation. Note, could this be speaking of Planet X or Nibiru? It is known, and the story comes down from ancient times, that there was not one creation but two, a creation and a recreation. It is a fact known to the wise that the earth was utterly destroyed once then reborn on a second wheel of creation. At the time of the great destruction of earth, God caused a dragon from out of heaven to come and encompass her about. The dragon was frightful to behold, it lashed its tail, it breathed out fire and hot coals, and a great catastrophe was inflicted upon mankind. The body of the dragon was wreathed in a cold bright light and beneath, on the belly, was a ruddy-hued glow, while behind it trailed a flowing tail of smoke. It spewed out cinders and hot stones and its breath was foul and stenchful, poisoning the nostrils of men. Its passage caused great thunderings and lightnings to rend the thick darkened sky, all heaven and earth being made hot. The seas were loosened from their cradles and rose up, pouring across the land. There was an awful, shrilling trumpeting which outpowered even the howling of the unleashed winds. Men, stricken with terror, went mad at the awful sight in the heavens. They were loosed from their senses and dashed about, crazed, not knowing what they did. The breath was sucked from their bodies and they were burnt with a strange ash. Then it passed, leaving earth enwrapped within a dark and glowering mantle which was ruddily lit up inside. The bowels of the earth were torn open in great writhing upheavals and a howling whirlwind rent the mountains apart. The wrath of the sky monster was loosed in the heavens. It lashed about in flaming fury, roaring like a thousand thunders, it poured down fiery destruction amid a welter of thick black blood. So awesome was the fearfully aspected thing that the memory mercifully departed from man, his thoughts were smothered under a cloud of forgetfulness. The earth vomited forth great gusts of foul breath from awful mouths opening up in the midst of the land. The evil breath bit at the throat before it drove men mad and killed them. Those who did not die in this manner were smothered under a cloud of red dust and ashes, or were swallowed by the yawning mouths of earth or crushed beneath crashing rocks. The first sky monster was joined by another which swallowed the tail of the one going before, but the two could not be seen at once. The sky monster reigned and raged above earth, doing battle to possess it, but the many-bladed sword of God cut them in pieces, and their falling bodies enlarged the land and the sea. In this manner the first earth was destroyed by calamity descending from out of the skies. The vaults of heaven had opened to bring forth monsters more fearsome than any that ever haunted the uneasy dreams of men. Men and their dwelling places were gone, only sky boulders and red earth remained where once they were, but amidst all the desolation a few survived, for man is not easily destroyed. They crept out from caves and came down from the mountainsides. Their eyes were wild and their limbs trembled, their bodies shook and their tongues lacked control. Their faces were twisted and the skin hung loose on their bones. They were as maddened wild beasts driven into an enclosure before flames, they knew no law, being deprived of all the wisdom they once had and those who had guided them were gone. The earth, only true altar of God, had offered up a sacrifice of life and sorrow to atone for the sins of mankind. Man had not sinned indeed but in the things he had failed to do. Man suffers not only for what he does but for what he fails to do. He is not chastised for making mistakes but for failing to recognize and rectify them. Then the great canopy of dust and cloud which encompassed the earth, enshrouding it in heavy darkness, was pierced by ruddy light, and the canopy swept down in great cloudbursts and raging storm waters. Cool moon tears were shed for the distress of earth and the woes of men. When the light of the sun pierced the earth's shroud, bathing the land in its revitalizing glory, the earth again knew night and day, for there were now times of light and times of darkness. The smothering canopy rolled away and the vaults of heaven became visible to man. The foul air was purified and new air clothed the reborn earth, shielding her from the dark hostile void of heaven. The rainstorms ceased to beat upon the faces of the land and the waters stilled their turmoil. Earthquakes no longer tore the earth open, nor was it burned and buried by hot rocks. The land masses were re-established in stability and solidity, standing firm in the midst of the surrounding waters. The oceans fell back to their assigned places and the land stood steady upon its foundations. The sun shone upon land and sea, and life was renewed upon the face of the earth. Rain fell gently once more and clouds of fleece floated across day skies. The waters were purified, the sediment sank and life increased in abundance. Life was renewed, but it was different. Man survived, but he was not the same. 
The sun was not as it had been and a moon had been taken away. Man stood in the midst of renewal and regeneration. He looked up into the heavens above in fear for the awful powers of destruction lurking there. Henceforth, the placid skies would hold a terrifying secret. Man found the new earth firm and the heavens fixed. He rejoiced but also feared, for he lived in dread that the heavens would again bring forth monsters and crash about him. When men came forth from their hiding places and refuges, the world their fathers had known was gone forever. The face of the land was changed and earth was littered with rocks and stones which had fallen when the structure of heaven collapsed. One generation groped in the desolation and gloom, and as the thick darkness was dispelled its children believed they were witnessing a new creation. Time passed, memory dimmed and the record of evens was no longer clear. Generation followed generation and as the ages unfolded, new tongues and new tales replaced the old. Chapter for the Affliction of God. This comes from the scroll of Karabal Pakthurman who wrote. The forebears of all the nations of man were once one people, and they were the elect of God who delivered all the earth over to them, all the people, the beasts of the field, the creatures of the wasteland and the things that grow. They dwelt through long ages in lands of peace and plenty. There were some who struggled harder, were more disciplined, because their forefathers had crossed the great dark void, their desires were turned Godward and they were called the children of God. Their country was undulating and forested. It was fertile, having many rivers and marshes. There were great mountains to the east and to the west, and in the north was a vast stony plain. Then came the day when all things became still and apprehensive, for God caused a sign to appear in the heavens, so that men should know the earth would be afflicted, and the sign was a strange star. The star grew and waxed to a great brightness and was awesome to behold. It put forth horns and sang, being unlike any other ever seen. So men, seeing it, said among themselves, Surely, this is God appearing in the heavens above us. The star was not God, though it was directed by his design, but the people had not the wisdom to understand. Then God manifested himself in the heavens. His voice was as the roll of thunders and he was clothed with smoke and fire. He carried lightings in his hand and his breath, falling upon the earth, brought forth brimstone and embers. His eye was a black void and his mouth an abyss containing the winds of destruction. He encircled the whole of the heavens, bearing upon his back a black robe adorned with stars. Such was the likeness and manifestation of God in those days. Awesome was his countenance, terrible his voice of wrath, the sun and moon hid themselves in fear and there was a heavy darkness over the face of the earth. God passed through the spaces of the heavens above with a mighty roar and a loud trumpeting. Then came the grim dead silence and black red lit twilight of doom. Great fires and smoke rose up from the ground and men gasped for air. The land was rent asunder and swept clean by a mighty deluge of waters. A hole opened up in the middle of the land, the waters entered and it sank beneath the seas. The mountains of the east and west were split apart and stood up in the midst of the waters which raged about. The northland tilted and turned over on its side. Then again the tumult and clamor ceased and all was silent. In the quiet stillness madness broke out among men, frenzy and shouting filled the air. They fell upon one another in senseless wanton bloodshed, neither did they spare woman or child, for they knew not what they did. They ran unseeing, dashing themselves to destruction. They fled to caves and were buried and, taking refuge in trees, they were hung. There was rape, murder and violence of every kind. The deluge of waters swept back and the land was purged clean. Rain beat down unceasingly and there were great winds. The surging waters overwhelmed the land and man, his flocks and his gardens and all his work ceased to exist. Some of the people were saved upon the mountainsides and upon the flotsam, but they were scattered far apart over the face of the earth. They fought for survival in the lands of uncouth people. Amid coldness they survived in caves and sheltered places. The land of the little people and the land of giants, the land of the necklace ones and the land of marshes and mists, the lands of the east and west were all inundated. The mountain land and the lands of the south, where there is gold and great beasts, were not covered by the waters. Men were distracted and in despair. They rejected the unseen God behind all things for something which they had seen and known by its manifestation. They were less than children in those days and could not know that God had afflicted the earth in understanding and not willfully, for the sake of man and the correction of his ways. The earth is not for the pleasure of man, but as a place of instruction for his soul. A man more readily feels the stirrings of his spirit in the face of disaster than in the lap of luxury. The tuition of the soul is a long and arduous course of instruction and training. 
God is good and from good evil cannot come. He is perfect and perfection cannot produce imperfection. Only the limited understanding of man sees imperfection in that which is perfect for its purpose. This grievous affliction of man was another of his great tests. He failed and in so doing followed the paths of unnatural gods of his making. Man makes gods by naming them, but wherein this is the benefit to him? Evil comes into the midst of mankind spawned by the fears and ignorance of men. An evil man becomes an evil spirit, and whatever evil there is on earth comes either from the evil of spirits or the evil of men.